Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Daniel Maccioni, and I want to talk about IoT cloud platforms and how to build one from scratch. Let's say that. Uh, I'm basing my experiences uh, building few startups, building few services uh, from scratch, and in this case, I will probably make a few references to Nubila, that is one of my startups, um, Endeavor startups that we built. Uh, so just for reference, uh, what Nubila is doing, as you can see, uh, it basically um, is a server to synchronize and send exchange data from devices, embedded devices, uh, to represent this data to uh, another client, for example, um, uh, I don't know, a browser, a Linux, or a tablet, or a smartphone, something like that. So, for example, you have a device um, that can be anything. It can be an industrial device, it can be uh, a wearable, what you want. That, it, for example, exchange uh, sends in this case that sends temperature, it sends uh, any kind of value, any kind of data. Um, the, our main server will store everything and it will draw um, graphs and such things, for example, to, contr to control all the devices. That's the point. Um, and I'm going to, to show. Uh, how are these our choices about technologies, about um, the process that we that we use? Um, keeping in mind a few things. Uh, this is a startup. It was a startup, and like every startup, uh, we want to bootstrap things as fast as possible. Uh, we want to. Um, how can I say? Uh, we want to understand if there's a market fit before going for production, before uh, the phase where all the expenses explode. And we want to be flexible about that because we may find out in, uh, in the process that what we thought, what, what we thought about the importance of our product, it's wrong. Uh, we want to be ready to change everything. Uh, very quickly to um, how can I say to follow the market to to find where the customers are and so prototyping it's very important and fast deployment because you want to to be uh, very quickly very quick in uh, uh, in iterations very fast iterations to improve your product to change it as quick as possible and I know we are engineers, and we tend to be very, very attracted to technical problems. And we want to uh, think about technical problems, and like this is the most important thing in the world. But we, our focus should be on the product, OK? And we want to be wrong as fast as we can. This is the Pixar philosophy. Uh, it's our, our star, OK? We are going to be wrong, for sure, many times, but we want to do that as fast as possible, so we can change, so we can fix it, hopefully. OK? Uh, I will start from the base, I mean, our backend, our server. Uh, what, what are the choices we, that we made, and why? And I would like to not giving you final answers, but trying to uh, convey the mindset and the, the problems, the key factors, uh, possible answers. So the first question is what language can we use? In, in my experience, in our experience, uh, Python is the default for the average scenario, okay? Uh, we want something that is dynamic and um, for the, for the developer that allows high productivity, uh, fast prototyping. And in this case, I know Python has flaws, uh, like every language. 
uh, but it has a huge support, a huge ecosystem, a very, very, very nice community. We find very easily documentations and add-ons, uh, libraries, modules, packages, everything we need. So it's, it's kind of the safe bet. Uh, we can change it quickly. We can um, exploit all the knowledge of the community, so I think it's fine. It's uh, arguably not very fast, arguably. It can be messy sometimes, the code. Uh, I know it can be, it can have problem with, uh, with uh, a sync, but I mean, in the, roughly speaking, in the average case, it's probably the safe bet. It's not the only one, of course. Uh, and uh, after the language, Python, uh, what framework? First, first thing, we want a framework, okay? We don't want to reinvent the wheel, we said. We want framework. Um, I want to focus on the product, so um, as much as possible, I want things done by somebody else, okay? <laughs> Possibly for free. So uh, here we choose uh, Flask. The, uh, it's um, arguably a micro framework. It's very thin. And what we like about Flask is that it's very explicit. So it's Pythonic on one end, and on the other hand, is easily replaceable because it's very explicit. Um, it also has good support, got com good community, but um, I am in the in the mindset that everything I'm doing right now in my startup could be wrong and could be uh, replaced in uh, I don't know in few months maybe because when the things is going to scale some decisions uh, are not true anymore and so we need something bigger and something more expensive and uh, the fact that a tool is very clear, is very easy, and it's very explicit. It's a very good point, okay? And in this case, as you can see, I hope, yeah, as you can see, uh, it's very simple. I mean, Hanello Word is like five lines of code with the import. It's very easy. Um, it's using py Python features like um, decorators and even if you don't know anything about uh, Flask, you can understand this code probably immediately because it's very, very explicit. What is this thing? Oh, it's a root. Oh, so it's an endpoint. Uh, it's a function. Okay, so probably when the client will call this endpoint, the function will be called. Fine. The return is the, what's the, the text returned by the endpoint in this case, plain text. Hmm. Uh, what request? Oh, it will be the request, right? Flask is using these global objects, request, there are many of them, session, and so on. Um, they are self-explanatory, okay? Everything you can need about the request, it's in the request object. Uh, and with the, um, with the use of these decorators, you can tag the function to be special functions. For example, to implement middlewares very easily. If you want that something has to be done before every request or after every request or the request itself and so on. Uh, so it's very clean. It's very nice. It's perfect for uh, bootstrap a server, bootstrap a, a, um, a startup, for example, a product in, the, in this case. There are many alternatives that I like, for example. Pyramid can be an alternative, arguably. Or the, the JavaScript ecosystem with Node.js. We, we find similar features in the Node.js ecosystem. JavaScript is a dynamic language. It passes prototyping too. And it has nice support, a huge community, of course. We have nice frameworks, for, for example, Express.js. But my default choice in this case is, is Python. But it can be also something else, as you wish. Uh, what about now? Uh, for example, database. 
what database we want to use for our server. Uh, as I said before, we are going in a startup process right now. So I have two, two main choices here, two main choices. Um, of course, SQL-based databases or document-based database. This is the, the, two, the two words, okay? And I would say that Postgres is my default choice for SQL databases. It has a huge support, um, very nice features. Uh, and it, again, it's the safe bet here. Uh, and on the other hand, if I want something like a document-based uh, database, we have a, another huge ecosystem of different databases, and I would say probably MongoDB is very nice. They are dif two different beasts. They are addressing different problems from two different point of view. Uh, apart from the base difference, the obvious difference, being document-based and being table-based, okay, uh, MongoDB and is, is designed with uh, scalability in mind and horizontal scalability instead of vertical scalability and it's probably best for big data uh, with the concurrency where data integrity is not that important uh, this is nice on, in MongoDB that it has support for shards like Postgres is vertical scaling mostly um, what's the choice here I would say honestly that right now, in the average case, okay, if I know for sure that my service is not about a very specific problem with a very specific demand, with very specific demands, and I will say um, Postgres, I will use Postgres probably, like that, the safe bet. Uh, for, for Nubila, we started with MongoDB uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, we kind of had this big data mindset uh, and then we appreciated the um, schema fluidity uh, how can i say uh, but it's probably postgres the best choice um with um yeah pick one okay <clears throat> sorry the point is that i don't care that much now and I don't care that much now because I'm, I want to focus on the product. And at first, at start, I don't have customers, okay? So I don't have big data or I don't have mass, massive problems with performance or any kind of stuff because I don't have customers at start. I will have them, luckily, but for now, it's not such a big deal, okay? And we will probably change it later anyway, so who cares. Both of them has nice support with Python and Flask. Um, about Postgres and SQL databases, I will probably use SQL Alchemy and Alembic. They are, they are both created by the same guy, I think. And it's uh, a nice ORM. So it's a nice layer abstraction about, on, above the database. It allows us to chain database, sort of, maybe in the future, but uh, migrations from the scratch, that's a nice feature. Upgrade, downgrade, and with, with a nice how to detect of schema changes. It works most of the time. And it's probably, it just works, okay? It just works fine. Uh, for the, on the other hand, we have PyMongo, probably one of the most famous clients uh, of MongoDB. And it's, again, very easy to use. Um, there's not much to say about that. Uh, it's MongoDB, so you don't have queries like SQL. You do a lot of stuff from the code, and you are, you are going to use PyMongo, and other libraries like that quite a lot, okay? And you can still have migrations sort of with tools, external tools, so it, it compensates some of the, of the problems with MongoDB. 
As I said before, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, and I want to be efficient. So right now, in this, in this process, at this step, I gladly trade um, some technical aspect for productivity and efficiency, okay? And I, want to, I don't want to deal with network problems. I don't want to deal with infrastructure. I don't want to deal with anything of the low-level stuff below my application, below my service. Um, so I will choose a, a platform as a service, for sure. Uh, we have many choices here, from Amazon to Microsoft, IBM, Google, whatever. Uh, I want something that is easy to deploy, we. Um, I want all the infrastructure problems solved, all of them, let's say. Uh, I want to deal as, least, as less as possible with resource allocation problems and with scaling, if I can. Um, my personal choice here is Heroku. Uh, Heroku is a platform as service, and uh, it, you deploy with Git, so the deploy with Heroku is basically Git push, with a little bit of settings, but Git push, as a plugin system integrated with the, with the service, so you can plug in and have pretty much everything you want, uh, databases, um, messaging services, there's thousands of them. It deals with auto-scaling by itself a little bit, and you pay what you use. So this is a nice thing that you have three tiers, so you can start developing without paying anything most of the time. It supports Steam. Um, it, of course, it's HTTP-based. This is another aspect, okay? Here I'm trading a little bit of flexibility, technological flexibility for um, how can I say, for usefulness, for usability. I'm, doing some, I'm using something easy uh, with a very big restriction, only HTTP or HTTPS, of course. It's fine for me, it's fine for now. Um, the core of the Heroku service, of course, is the app. So we have app, our, our server will be an app. Um, it implements app pipelines so we can have the dev app and the staging and the production and we can promote our service from staging to production for example when it's ready and it deals with everything quite nicely and simple the, mm, the building mechanism is very simple too uh, it basically creates uh, in, uh, in Heroku terminology a slug that's a snapshot from the source of your of your server, it recognizes it recognizes automatically most of the of the settings. So if you are using Python, it will probably recognize it by itself, or Node.js, or a lot of things. And he creates this lag from the source, installing all the dependencies by itself most of the time, and it creates a VM from this lag. And it's called uh, slug, but it's kind, of, it's kind of two different things. From the slug, it creates a VM, and then it starts your process. And the process, it runs in a dyno. This is, again, Heroku terminology. Um, a dyno is basically a container with your process inside and an environment with um, settings for this process, all kind of stuff. Uh, the setup is Enough easy, I would say, quite easy. Uh, everything is around this proc file. Uh, every line in the proc file is a dyno, a process. And uh, it basically, it's, it's um, a, a, a line that starts your process. In this case, I'm in Garnicorn, for example, to start the app, Python app, Garnicorn, it's quite common, it's the default, I would say, with Flask. And if I, for example, if I need workers, if I need salary, I, I will add that different dynos and I will add different line here with the, with the right common line, okay? And I would say with the server, we are pretty much done, okay? We have a database, 
we have a deployment system with stage in production. We, we have um, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, what's left now? Okay, returning to our big picture. The communication, for example. I have IoT devices, so how my IoT devices will communicate with my server? HTTP? Mm, probably not. Probably don't want that. I, I don't want to assume too much about those devices. They can be very, very tiny. So I don't know. I need something else. Here, again, my choice, my default choice is a messaging protocol, a publish subscribe protocol here. Uh, in this case, working with an IoT system, I would probably choose MQTT. Uh, for uh, if you don't know exactly what is a public subscribe protocol, here is very easy to understand. You have uh, clients and a, and a broker at the center. The broker is the server, basically. Uh, the, the different clients some subscribes on different topics. They are like channels, so uh, we, you can be subscribed to more than one topics at a time. But you basically subscribe your uh, the client subscribe itself to few topics, and then it receives from that point, it receives uh, all the messages that are sent on that channel, on that topic. And it can send message too, for example, with a publish. So you, you publish your messages and you receive all the messages sent by everything else on that channel. In our case, we will have the broker and our backend, our server, is, will be a client of the broker, okay? So all the little devices will deal with the broker, and we, as a, um, as a backend, we will receive everything sent from the devices. Again, Python have, has everything, so of course there's a library for Python that supports MQTT. It's an open source one. Uh, it's PAO MQTT client. It's, they renamed it a few years ago. Uh, you, um, the code is quite simple, I think, even if you don't know maybe Python very well, but it's quite simple. You have basically a, a loop start that sends on the thread uh, the, the broker. Okay, maybe, I'm sorry, the, the connection with the broker. Okay, we are, we are the client here, so we create a client, and every time a message arrives on that topic that we subscribe at, we do what we want with that message. Can be anything that message. It's a pay, it has a payload. In our case, I mean, I would maybe can be a JSON for now. Maybe a, a zip JSON or a compressed JSON. I know, but for now it, it can work. Hmm. I'm not going to trouble myself with performance not right now. I don't know if that point will be the, the weak point of my uh, about performances of my system. So I will say for now, it's JSON. Let's see how it works. OK. Uh, the advantages of using a um, publish subscribe protocol, in this case, MQTT, is that there's, a, of course, uh, ba it, they are based on TCP, MQTT is based on TCP, so messages arrive for real. Uh, it's fast, it's faster than some of the alternatives, uh, it's arguably faster than Rabbit MQT MQ, uh, of course, because it's simpler, okay? It has less features, it doesn't support queues, it's a little bit a stripped down version of more complex protocols. Uh, it's fine because we are dealing with IoT devices and so it's resource constrained devices. I think it's a, it's a good sweet spot between costs and, and gains. And we have a plugin for Heroku, Cloud MQTT, for example. Uh, or we can have a, a broker, an open source broker that is Mosquito. Hmm. Uh, in our experience, when we developed Nubila at first, Cloud MQTT was not mature enough for us. It was really in heavy under heavy development at the time. 
and so we used Mosquito. Right now, honestly, I don't know. I think probably now is very much is more mature now. It's probably usable Cloud MQTT, but for us, uh, we didn't have a choice really here. So we tried, but we can't. We, we couldn't. So we use Mosquito. And okay, problem here. Uh, Mosquito is a, of course is a server program that runs and runs on TCPP not HTTP, okay? So how we plug this thing in Heroku? And the answer is that we don't. This Mosquito can't run on Heroku right now, easily, let's say. So I want, again, a service that allows me to uh, run processes, in this case, Mosquito, the broker, without dealing with low level stuff okay i don't want to have a pc under my desktop <laughs> or in the server room with the broker all the infrastructure and the safe uh, the security problems no i don't want to deal with that as much as possible i would say so i want a vmn uh, virtual machine on demand system okay service somewhere i want this virtual machine to also set up themselves in the cloud i want them to be uh, under my full control about everything, deleting them, stopping them, um, having an um, administrator shell on them, whatever. And I want a static API, of course. And I want a complete API. That's a nice thing to want. I want to uh, deal with these virtual machines with an API. Uh, in this case, our choice was DigitalOcean. There are many of them, I guess. Uh, uh, DigitalOcean is nice for us because you can do pretty much everything you can do on the on the UI on the web app in their site. You can do uh, with the code. Okay, you can do with the API. You can create, the destroy these virtual machines. You can do whatever you want, and you can create snapshots of these virtual machines and clone them. So you can have multiple virtual machines, basically identical, the same, and of course it has. More than once, honestly, yeah. More than more than one library of with Python. Uh, we, for example, here in the example we have DigitalOcean library, Python DigitalOcean. Um, in the DigitalOcean terminology, a virtual machine is a droplet, and so you can just create a droplet with few parameters here. It has different regions, uh, different sizes, different costs of these uh, droplets. Um, you can give them orders with the code. You can do whatever you want with Python. So again, um, with scalability in mind, yeah, now I need one of them. If I need two of them, if I need three of them, I can just pop more of them uh, in the cloud. And I can possibly balance this, this, this load. Okay, automatically with with the API. So pretty neat. Okay, what about the last things? Okay, what's what's on the devices? This is the last piece of the puzzle, right? Of course, right now I'm assuming that Linux is everywhere. It couldn't be, okay, it could these devices could be not so so powerful than um, I mean how can I say, not so powerful that support Linux, but for now, for this example, I would say that I have Linux everywhere. And it will be even more true in the future, it will be more and more common, I think. Uh, and in this case, my choice is Go, as a language, to develop clients. Uh, Go is fast, it's, roughly speaking, it's easy to easy to learn, and it's designed for concurrency, so it has uh, nice features. I mean, Go is a, is a weird language for some aspects, uh, but I think it's in a sweet spot between being a low-level language and a, and a higher-level language. It, has, uh, it lacks some features that we think it's, it should have, probably. It lacks templates, generics, but it has other features that are very modern, very um, very well done, such as concurrency for go routines, channels, 
uh, and it deploys everywhere, almost everywhere, where we, where there's a Linux, of course, or Mac or Windows. Uh, it has awesome tools, and this thing that is statically compile everything and deploy with Go for, I mean, most cases, it's just a copy. So you can just copy your binary without dependencies at all on the on the device, and it works. It just works. Uh, nice community again. I, I'm constantly noticing this thing because it's very important for me in my case, for example, when you start tapping something, when you're bootstrapping something, uh, you don't want to spend too much time debugging things that maybe are, are already debugged and solved by somebody else. Find this, this answer as quick as possible is a nice feature. Um, I think right now Go is, is, is very nice for developing embedded. And we have, again, MQTT package for Go. As you can see, the code here is um, a little bit more verbose than Python. Um, here I'm not dealing with errors for this example, and it should be a little bit more verbose than that. But I think it's manageable. The, the code base uh, tends to be quite, uh, quite clear, quite expressive, again, very explicit. And I really like explicit things right now because they are, be they are replaceable, easily replaceable. Um, again, I'm just creating a client here, linking to the broker, uh, connecting, subscribing to a topic, and waiting for a payload, and eventually publishing something. Hmm? Uh, Go, I, I, would, uh, I was saying before, it has modern features for a very low-level language, arguably. Uh, one of them, it, it accepts JSON very quickly. I mean, I can translate a struct in a JSON and vice versa very easily. So, perfect. For a prototype, for easy deployment, it's perfect. Let's try that. As you can see, I'm just mapping a struct with a JSON structure that can be easily our payload in the MQTT services. Uh, so, let me see if I try to show you something. Ah, fail. Let's try that. No. Okay. So, for example, this is a very small screen, but this is like the dashboard or startup for now. Uh, and. Here on the left panel, I have um, I should have, yeah I have a, a client connected to the broker. It, it's simulating a device. It could, it's a, the, my Go client connected to the broker. Uh, again, it could be everywhere. It could be uh, in here on the right. Okay, here. Uh, Nubila. Uh, this is our specific case. Um, just for reference. We have a very simple API to deal with, with our system. So in this case, you can just print something on a pipe and the, the, our client will send the message to the, to the old system. So you can just basically write on a file with the Linux. So you can use every language, every program, everything you want. And when you want to send something in the Nubula system, you just write a file, okay? So in this case, I'm uh, for example, I'm sending a temperature reader, readings, okay? And I see the reading here, I see the point data, and I see the event here, just arise, for example. Hmm? Um, the, the, the broker uh, in, uh, in the cloud has received the message, delivered the message to every other interest devices, every, every other device that subscribe to that message and receive that, and I see it in real time on the in my browser, for example, okay? I think my time is over. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Daniele. We have actually a bit of time for question and answer, so uh, feel free to ask something. Hi, uh, two questions in real. In real. Mm. Uh, the first is uh, why use MQTT instead of uh, plain HTTP request uh, like get, post, or something like that? Hmm. And the second is uh, the event triggered in the web browser is a WebSocket connection. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The second, the, the second question. Uh, the event triggered by the browser. Okay. Uh, there is a WebSocket connection from the webs from the client to the server. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It should be WebSocket. Yes. Uh, it depends on. On the, uh, this is a question about the, the web app. It's the, it depends the support. It could be polling, and it could be web web socket. Both cases. Uh, about the first question, why MQTT? Uh, I think it's basically uh, just for low memory footprint and performances. Uh, I am not going to assume that the the device uh, it uh, is powerful enough to handle a full stack HTTP. Okay. And we we'll plus a lot of nice features such as uh, the messages safe, uh, safety messages. Uh, you can s be very sure that the message is sent uh, or not. I mean, there are these publish subscribe protocols have nice features about that. Okay, you when you when you uh, subscribe uh, a packet uh, package, I'm sorry, a message, and the server and the broker says okay you are sure that this message is gone for real and it will be stored and saved and these kind of things. Other questions? Hi. Nice talk, thank you. Thank um, you. Did you deal with the mosquito high availability issues, uh, clustering it or stuff like that? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, mosquitoes issues such as? About the, it's a high availability, so um, not balancing traffic toward uh, multiple mosquito instances or things like that. Uh, not yet. Unfortunately, not yet. Okay. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I would say that these are known issues. Um, uh, we have to we, we when we encounter them we, we have to develop some sort of balancer in front of mosquitoes probably mm. okay. or having multi, you can chain brokers if I remember correctly so you can have multiple brokers mm -hmm. in chain and you balance the traffic some somehow okay. uh, I'm I'm betting on DigitalOcean doing that for doing that <laughs> let's see how it goes okay. thank you very much Okay, so all the questions. Hi, uh, go on the client. Mm. Uh, it's quite unusual. Mm? How do you deal with uh, with garbage collection first and second? Uh, do you need concurrency, the 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 most uh, the, the most interesting property of Go? Mm. Uh, in in this case, for this simple client, probably not concurrency. I mean, concurrency is everywhere because you 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 have the features there, and so you can use them. Just so uh, all um, what, what in Python in a in a Python client is a thread. We, of course, in Go is a Go routine that deals with the broker, and so you you still have them, right? You, why don't use them? It wasn't here. Um, a killer application, I would say, a killer feature. But for us, the killer features was the portability and the tools. So it's very easy to program, it's very easy to deploy, um, and very easy to, to use in general. Uh, it's fast, this was the point. It's the, the sweet spot on the cool, OK? Um, probably, I wouldn't say so unusual in, a, in, a, in embedded for, for our case, for a startup. Uh, 
many people believe that the uh, Internet of Things is bringing a lot of issues in terms of security. And yeah. what I've seen you here is that uh, I've not seen any encryption. I've seen everything on the Internet. Yeah. So can you please elaborate a little bit about uh, this type of problems and how you plan to tackle them? Yeah, um, I didn't mention security issues here because I could just uh, have a uh, talk just about that. Uh, I will, it wasn't on the, the topic for the talk, but yeah, you, you have to encrypt everything. Everything. The devices has a unique ID and a secret key and you encrypt all the... The JSON will probably be not the JSON, but the JVT. I mean, you that's a big issue. Yeah. Um, what can I say? The, the, connect, the part with the, the server is e the easiest part because you are, going, you are throwing there the HTTPS, so you are going, you're throwing there all the non security features that we know about them for web. I mean, this is, this is a solved, prob solved problem uh, for the. Um, communication between the device and, um, and the broker, uh, it really depends uh, about the, how much powerful are your devices. What, what can I do with the devices? Can, do inc can they encrypt, for example? They, are they powerful enough to encrypt every package? Yes, probably. Sometimes not. It, it depends. Uh, it's really a big, a big issue. I'm sorry. Okay, other questions? Are you sure there are no other questions? Okay, so thank you, Daniele. <laughs>